Welcome, mercenary captains. I hear you are looking for information about the local area. Well, I might just be able to help you out. War Tales, like any RPG worth its salt, has a map full of different locations that you can explore and unique encounters at every single one of these locations. Today we're going to be looking at the central region of Tiltrin and all of the secrets that you can possibly find in this part of the map. We'll look at all the possible story missions that it takes to complete the story for this particular region, all the most dangerous and most valuable combat encounters, and even all of the minor encounters and how you can weasel every single secret out of this part of the world. Check the timestamps if you're looking for something in particular, but we are about to get started. Ah, Tiltron, what a beautiful region to begin in. You will be dropped off here in what is basically the dead center of the map, and nothing but the road to guide you up into town, so your very main locations here are going to be the Tiltron Jail, centrally located right here on the peninsula in the lake, and the town of Stromkop. The jail is not going to be the hub for any quests, at least not in the initial portion of of the game, but it is probably where you're going to make the most money selling off prisoners to the jail. Makes me wonder what exactly they do with the prisoners after you drop them off. Stromkop is going to be your other hub. It will have all the services you need and the tavern to give you your bounties to get you started. First off with the story missions. As the Lady Mayoress tells us, the land is gripped by a conflict between the Edoranian refugees and the local population. You are going to bring the conflict between the refugees and the natives to a close through five different missions. I'm going to give the overview now and then we're going to go into the details of all the different missions. You can shortcut finding these missions by talking to the informant here at the tavern, or just by exploring the world, you will be able to pick them up on your own. Three missions are very easy to find at the beginning. You can pick up new owners at Old Wilbert's Sheepfold, you can pick up Sentence to Death at the Wealthy Farm, and then you have a standoff between a bandit crew and the guards sent to hunt them down over here on the northeast track of the map. Depending on which faction you align with during these missions, you will then have new quest givers open up for your final missions. We're going to go ahead and knock these out, siding with the Tiltron locals, because I have already completed this whole region in favor of the refugees and I'll be able to immediately catch you guys up on what the refugee side of things will look like as you begin to advance these. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Merc's honor has to go. Killed a man in the country just to collect a tiny bounty. All right. Sheepfolds first, and this is the quest titled New Owners. So here are Wilbert's two properties. He has Old Wilbert's Fishery and then Old Wilbert's Sheepfold. Over here at the Sheepfold, if you enter the location, you see that there are refugee squatters who have arrived here, the two parents, and then they have a younger daughter who is trying to manage family affairs. You speak with her, and then she wants to be able to negotiate staying here at the Sheepfold from Old Wilbert, and she wants you to help you negotiate with him by four or any other means. Simply hike over to the fishery and you can have this little conflict resolved quite easily. We get to jump in on the argument between Danny and Wilbert. Why refuse? We are sheep farmers. If you would just let us stay in the sheepfold, we could... Absolutely not! I inherited this part from my sister. Uh, you guys get the idea. So they're fighting. He doesn't want to be able to give the sheep farm over, and she is stubbornly refusing to leave. If you go and speak with old Wilbert, you have a couple ways of resolving this. You can threaten him to allow the refugees to stay, increasing your wanted level, but I don't believe this will ever actually make the guards hunt you down, but if you already have have sticky fingers, you might not want to go this route. You can bribe him just to buy the sheepfold off of him, depending on how early in the game you are, 100 gold might be a lot, might not. Or you can choose to actually evict the refugees for him, and he will give you 20 influence, 20 progress on the story mission. Those are both the exact same as Danny will be giving you, and he will be giving you a fly backpack piece. We're not sure exactly what it does. Danny is promising a belt attachment, which is a medallion, and is going to give you one willpower. As I said, we are siding with the Tiltron natives on this one, and squatter's rights probably had not been invented yet, so here we go. We're going to go for that fly, and we are going to kick her out. Choosing to kick her out will initiate combat with Danny here. I'm not sure if she is locked as a level 3 combatant, which if so, in the very early levels, she might actually be a threat to your party. Uh, but for us, I'm honestly feeling a little bit bad at ganging up on her like this. Ha! Fine work you've done there. That's a relief. Wow. My conscience is screaming right now. But here we go, we got our rewards. I don't know what I'm gonna do with that sheepfold yet, but it was a matter of principle that 
the poor woman had to die. Yep, okay. Here we find that the fly reward is a backpack attachment that will give a bonus to your entire troop, so you have a chance to catch two fish at a time. Remember, you can only catch fish at certain locations, and you have to assign the angler profession to a party member to be able to do that, and you use fish hooks, which you can craft by the tinkerer out of iron ore or buy from random merchants. It's a pretty good way to be able to acquire an extra source of food if you don't like fighting all of the animal herds and roving bands of wolves and boars in the area, but I have not gone too far down the angler profession myself. There we go, we have completed the first mission and we just got a pop-up saying the refugee leader has caught a wind of your actions and would like to speak to you at the Haven. So that is going to open up potential future storyline missions for this region. We're still gonna go through the basic ones first and then report in to the Haven to see what the refugee leader might want with us. For completeness sake, I should say that you can hop back to the sheepfold here and speak with the Pavis and fully evict them wondering where their daughter has gone and yep just absolutely kick them out the wife there has an extra mission that you can give her wood in exchange for a family recipe to be able to unlock uh, if i go to the compendium what was it you unlock mutton stew an old family recipe that she gives you and then you can also just take all of the possessions in the area without it being labeled as stealing. Unclear if these are Wilbert's old things or if they are things that the refugees brought with them and had to leave uh, without packing. Truly, I am the scum of the earth. I doubt things are going to get any cheerier with this next mission as we approach the wealthy farm. The setup for this story mission is that the husband of the farm has connections with the bandits and is set to be hung for his crimes against the village. We have the village chief here ready to execute justice and the wife of the husband who is just completely distraught pleading with you that you find his bandit friends who are hidden in a camp along the lake very close by. You make a pass through this forest right along the lake going, if we pull up the map, basically due north, you'll be able to find this lakeside camp, which is a very interesting location. It is quite out of the way and secluded, but very useful because of this character, Attic, right here. I wonder what possibly gave him that name. He will have a rotating selection of stolen goods at discounted prices. So if you buy these, they're not going to raise your suspicion. But if the guards come and question you, they will make you either pay for having them or return them to the guards. This is actually an opportunity to fence your own stolen goods without raising suspicion. So usually if you are stealing goods to be able to then turn and make a profit selling them, you get hit with a double whammy of suspicion because you gain suspicion when you steal them and you gain suspicion suspicion when you sell the hot item. This is a way to be able to fence those goods without increasing your suspicion further. Now you are selling the stolen goods at a hefty loss. This wood is going for one crown, whereas the non-stolen wood goes for four crowns. So you have to weigh out what you want out of this transaction. Speaking with Isabeth here, we'll reveal that the husband of the farm is one of their new recruits. And she says he seemed capable enough. You warn her, one of your friends is to be hung from the gallows and she takes it on her honor to help them out and is going to lead the band away to confront the local village group um, who are trying to hang her friend. And that means you can now, of course, loot the location without it being tagged as stealing. Now, come on, did they only have alcohol here? We can follow directly after them, though there is no real time limit on when you are going to go and get involved but we will follow right along their heels and be able to initiate the next portion, the battle between the bandits and the farmers, which the, uh, the game graphics for how they split the groups is kind of wonky. Release the refugees immediately. But you, you brought bandits. Mercenaries, are you willing to let them slaughter us to save a thief? He's just a desperate farmer. Let him go and not harm will come to you. Not, not harm will come to you. Okay, well, suffice to say, we get to choose which side we are going to enter the battle on. And as with all of these, we are going with Team Villager. So we are going to turn and attack the bandits. Thank you for exposing yourselves and coming out of your camp to meet us. By attacking Isabeth, we stand to gain adjustable straps, influence, and progress in the region. If we went the other way, we would be able to get Bar of Soap, influence, and again, the exact same progress on the story missions. So let us dive in. Because we are getting assistance from the city guard, bringing a phalanx soldier and a foot soldier, along with the buff from the village chief, 
doubling our movement we should be able to roll over this battle fairly easily here i like to place their soldiers the allied soldiers out right in harm's way i don't care if they get sacrificed for the good of the party but i do like to try and shelter the captain the friendly captain because if he gets engaged by the enemies then we lose the buff that he is going to provide to us by the same token we want to dive in onto isabeth here because as the leader on the bandit side she is going to allow all of her friends to always crit which is a crazy powerful ability we do need to be careful as we engage because her basic attack will strike everybody around her foe and friend alike and if she strikes multiple targets she will spawn poison gas clouds underneath them so there's just layers and layers of what her weapon does and uh it is a very good very good but uh not as good <laughs> as our champ right here I am playing on the normal difficulty, though to be able to set up having all the map revealed, my characters are a little over leveled for progressing in the story. So don't be afraid to tackle these story missions as you come upon them. You don't have to wait and power level your characters to be able to do them. Now that combat has been resolved, we can return to the wealthy farm. The, the husband is mysteriously absent and we can speak with the village chief for receiving our reward for helping them against the bandits. Your ill-advised intervention almost cost us our lives, but since you killed the bandits for us, I'm willing to forgive you. Here's a little something for your trouble. Now skedaddle and leave the good townsfolk in peace. So we gain our influence, adjustable straps, and the fate of children progresses 40%. The adjustable straps will give you additional movement. I recommend placing them onto a archer because they have such low base movement to begin with. If you don't have an archer or you don't particularly want to go for that, then putting it on anybody will feel pretty nice. Our third mission takes us northeast from Strumcup. If we check in on the map, there is the town. And then if you follow this road up here to be able to get up to this uh, mountain outcropping of the Sinister Cave and the Guard Outpost. If you speak at the Guard Outpost, they will tell you that they're in a stalemate hunting down the bandit band inside the cave and they hire you to infiltrate and then take out the bandits for them. And when you speak to the bandits inside, they say that they'll pay you whatever the guards are paying you for you to kill the guards instead. So you just get to choose which side you want to do battle against and each side, quite interestingly, has a very valuable chest that is locked and requires a golden key. Well, depending on which side you go with, you will be able to pick up the key, I believe, off of the leader's corpse. We're going to play through it and find out what is inside these awesome, awesome chests. I'm sorry, Bertram, but the law of the land must be upheld. They are promising us influence, progress in the story mission, and a hundred crowns to be able to kill each other. It's the same offer on either side. So we will attack. Bertram, ringleader, level two enemies, four hoodlums, and three poachers. Bertram is exactly like the previous bandit leader that we just fought. He gives crit, guaranteed crit, to all of his allies as long as he is not engaged. And he has the Devious Whirlwind Knife, attacking everyone around him and applying bleeding. So we're going to throw the exact same strategy and see if this hammer can just bash his face in before he's able to do anything nasty against us. It works again, the full compliment right into Barthram, dropping him with a crit. Man, Tuff is a absolute killing machine. Don't want to mess with her. The rest of this combat has been going predictably enough in our favor. If you guys are looking for a combat guide, check out my Let's Play where we are following a bandit gang, Max Crime and Chaos playthrough, and I show off more full combat of more equal levels there, and also I might be doing a full combat guide later on as well. So subscribe to the channel if you are enjoying the video thus far, and if you want to be able to see more of my War Tales guides when they come out. As the final bandits flee away, we are able to pick over the spoils and see what we have won. So here we have Captain Rovind has made his appearance. So, Bertram is dead. My men and the good citizens of Tiltron will be glad to hear it. I must commend you for your courage and your devotion to our cause. Here is the reward the Lady Mayoress promised me. You deserve it. Goodbye. We gain the crowns. And then we can inspect Bertram's body to be able to pick up the golden key. 
Now we can choose to use the golden key over here on this locked box. Or let's see if that other chest is actually still here. I am not sure if it will be. Ah, it is. Okay. Let's see what is inside the guard's locked box first. Now that we have unlocked it with the golden key. The golden key is expended and no longer in our inventory. So we find 12 crowns, 3 comfrey flowers, and a pocketbook. Troop bonus generates a small amount of knowledge experience for each rest. So your knowledge usually increases when you craft things for the first time in any of the different categories, whether it is the tinkerer, the armorer, the baker, they will all give you knowledge bonuses as you explore new things. And you will also get knowledge bonuses for exploring new locations. This will be able to give you a trickle of experience just as you pass days at camp. I just did a little bit of testing here. I passed two days back to back in the camp, camp rest periods, and it gave us nothing. It did not increase his occupation experience, and we were at 65 knowledge experience the entire time. So this could be bugged or I'm not actually understanding it. Put in the comments if it's just that I'm misunderstanding it, but it looks like it's broken right now. Hopefully they fix it. We're still in the very early stages of early access, so I don't expect it to stay broken. If we check in on the Outlaws chest and inspect here, we were able to acquire a ruby, a sapphire, and 10 units of iron ore. So this is going to be the much more valuable chest in terms of raw crowns, but if they ever fix the trinket over here, then being able to get that knowledge, tr the trickle of knowledge experience would be better if it worked. I suppose that you may still want to go for the trinket, hoping that they patch it soon, and then you will have it in inventory when a fix comes along, but I don't know, it's up to you guys. Now that we have wrapped up those first three missions of mercenary work, it is time to go down to the Haven and see what the leader of the refugees wants with us. Because it is so conveniently on the way here, the abandoned tower, if we pull up the map, it is right here directly to the east of the jail. The abandoned tower has a blacksmith who deserted the army chained up. If you pick the lock, you can free him, and then you need to choose if you're going to return him to the military or take him to work for the refugees who are desperately in need of skilled craftsmen. Now we have the blacksmith in tow. It says that having a deserter as part of the party is going to draw additional attention. Where is he? Here he is, hiding by the tent. It's going to draw additional attention from Count Lehart's men. There they are. That is the banner of Count Lehart. Thankfully just missed our campsite in the night. So we are going to book it off to the Haven and say goodbye to that patrol. We want to be able to succeed here because that is going to fuel our resources with a lot of the repair materials required to be able to fix the damaged armor, which I find very valuable. Oh, there's a huge roving band of boars. All right. Be careful up here in the forests. There's a lot of bandits and wild animals all over the zone. Nope. I don't want to fight you right now. Just want to talk to the refugees. Here at the Haven, the people of interest are the lady up front who works as a merchant. So you can drop off supplies or be able to pick up a few extra things. She doesn't sell food or uh, repair materials, which is a little bit unfortunate to have this as kind of be an effective pit stop out in the middle of nowhere, but you can be able to use her as a merchant to dump off some of your extras. And here, Sarah wants to have the uh, the smith working for her. So we're gonna go ahead and hand over Cleas, the blacksmith. There we go. Be able to collect our reward, 20 raw materials. Beautiful, beautiful, and a little bit of influence. Oh, that did progress the fate of Tiltrin. Ah, okay. So there is another location that you would be able to drop him off where he would be able to work for the natives of Tiltrin, but this was so convenient to be able to take him over here to the Haven, and that is what we did. Now, Fergas, the refugee leader. My name is Fergus. I am the former Lord Mayor of Courtia, and I now lead the refugees. It is I who requested your presence. 
It seems you have chosen to support the citizens of Tiltron rather than our cause. I wish I could change your mind. Perhaps offering you a mission that would be worth your while will do more than a thousand words. So he will give you this mission regardless of the choices that you made in the earlier stages. He's either trying to change your mind to flip you to his side, or if you have already sided with the refugees, he feels that you are an ally ready to help his cause. They have a woodcutter camp up to the north, and he wants to warn them, the people at the woodcutting camp, that the villagers are all up in a frenzy and are trying to sabotage their operations. And I am trying to get away from these boars to be able to progress the mission. We have an infected rat nest over there spreading the plague. We'll deal with that a little bit later and show what that looks like. But right now we are on a beeline to the woodcutting camp and it looks like there could be problems out here. When you see the birds flying away in the trees, that means that there is something roving around in the forest. Thankfully, when you go to the locations, they don't bother you. So here we are at the woodcutting camp. You can steal the wood at the camp. Uh, but if you talk to Anthus, then you are able to warn him. The villagers automatically appear, and he immediately asks for mercenary assistance. Oh, like everybody here in this world. All right, I'd really rather not fight the wolves before we get over into this conflict. So we see the villager vigilantes have come up, and the refugee band are out to meet them. As we get engaged, we see them yelling at each other. The villagers are telling them that this forest is sacred. And honestly, the refugees don't care because there's no villagers up here or any other particular markings showing that it has any religious significance. And now we choose which side we are going to jump in on. We can choose to attack the tool defenders and gain a bunch of wood, or we can help the refugees and gain a bunch of beans. So that is a food source and can also be cooked into a couple of the cooked meal options. My guess is we're going to get the same final quest version whichever way we choose, but we have been siding with the defenders, the natives this entire time, so down with the refugees, I say. The refugee leaders seem to be all the same, and Anthus here, head of the woodcutter group, is no exception. Guaranteed crit on all of his allies and a devious whirlwind knife strike, attacking everybody around him, and if he hits multiple targets, he will spawn poison clouds. We'll see if he goes down the same way as as all of his predecessors have coming up here with Tuff, the lady in the cloak who has downed every single leader in a single turn. <laughs> it's guaranteed, it's guaranteed. I'll show off Tuff's build at the end of this if you guys want to see how she puts out so much damage. Part of it is that we are a little bit power leveled compared to the story missions because I was uh, progressing and exploring to be able to be able to show off the entire map here at the beginning and then go through and knock out the story quests. So usually you will be attempting these at a slightly lower level than my party is right now. Now that the enemies have been devastated, we will be able to pick up our rewards. We find crowns, cloth, lockpick, and a preserving jar. Something is floating in this jar. It looks human. Okay, that's just weird. It's a trinket, you can't really interact with it. Hey, one of our boar friends leveled up. Oh, tough. The Bulwark. She is a level 4 destroyer using the Iron Mace. This is the one that you are able to craft yourself. It was turned out in superior uh, quality, plus 7 strength there. She's wearing the Corporal's Plate Armor, which I picked up a while ago, honestly. Should upgrade that. Her shield is also the higher level one that you can craft. She's got... Pound, Weakening Blow, and Wrath. She has gone down the upgrade path of Destroyer, giving her the Weakening Blow and allowing her to equip Heavy Armor, and then picked up Valor's Duel, so she gains Valor points every time she engages with an enemy, meaning that if she can chain through multiple engagements, or right now with the build that I have, a bunch of pikemen, if they can push the enemies away from her and cause them to re-engage, I generate a whole lot of Valor points. Now the villagers will take over the wood camp, and I have been ambushed by wolves. So we'll see you guys after I deal with the wolves and we can pick up our quest rewards. The wolves are gone. Tough incredibly hit another feat point to be able to get even more overpowered. And now it's time to pick up those quest rewards. So we can speak to Gunner here in the center of the camp mercenaries. You are as much our heroes as those of the tools. I can only imagine the wrath of those creatures had the refugees continued to fell but one tree. 
So he's got some kind of tall tales for the creatures of the forest. And now we get our beans. Gotta make the beans. It's time to make camp eat our way through some of these beans and wait for word to come of where we will get our final quest. The Lady Mayoress of Stromkop awaits you in the town hall. She has something important to tell you. So if you had sided with the refugees instead, this mission would be coming from the refugee leader at the Haven. Right now we are receiving the letter from the Mayoress. I'm actually very curious what the refugee leader is going to say to us now that we have sided against him in everything. So let's find that out before we go into town. Okay, he is here. Rumor has it you would rather defend fairy tale creatures than help the refugees. It seems I was wrong about you. All right. When you do return the blacksmith, he's actually setting up shop here. So he'll be able to repair your weapons and sell you raw materials which does make this a excellent stop on your way to this corner of the map. It is a key location here because you have the boss of the zone, Matthias Lund, walking around in this field, and then you have this rat infestation, and you also have this tower controlled by the bandits. So you're gonna do a lot of missions in this area and having a place that you can return to be able to guarantee repairs on your armor is pretty nice. Hopping over to the town hall, the mayoress has never really interacted with us beyond saying that her area is very war-torn right now. I commend you for your services, mercenaries. The locals hail you as the new Jeru, who is a kind of religious figure for this world. Better yet, you have come to our aid and shown us that we must fight back. The good people of Tiltren are now determined to drive away the refugee menace. Now, it is, it is true, most of the refugees have turned to crime. Join me at the Haven, we will rid our lands of this filth. We will be receiving 200 crowns, 50 influence, and a border pass, which is required to be able to enter either of the neighboring regions. Now, interestingly enough, the 200 crowns is also a way that you can buy your way through. So effectively, we are gaining passage to both of the other regions via this quest. If you had been siding with the refugees, things would be flipped, and the refugee leader would be telling you that they are storming the town because they demand to be treated as equals here in Tiltron, and you would meet him here in the town to join a battle up against the mayoress and her personal guards. Now instead, we are trekking back to the Haven for the final assault on the refugees to drive them out once and for all. It seems battle has already been joined here at the Haven. Let's jump in and see where things stand. Finally, the lads were starting to think you wouldn't come, but I knew you would keep your word. Let's go and get rid of these intruders. And yeah, I think I've been using different accents for every character every time they speak. <laughs> so we fight Fergus, the refugee leader. He is the ringleader of the Edorian refugees. They are only level two, but there's going to be a lot of them. Five hoodlums and four poachers along with the ringleader. And we get three allies, the mayoress and two other helpers. This should be easy on the same level of difficulty as the other story missions so far. This is going to be the most interesting battlefield though because there are already clouds of poison everywhere, fire, a lot of our allies are already damaged, a lot of the enemies are already damaged in these little piecemeal engagements. So we want to be smart on how we roll through and we help these basically no health allies be able to win all of these and kind of knock over the easy ones and then be able to gang up in numbers against the remaining refugees and we have Fergus. The ultimate leader right here. This time it is not going to be so easy to just immediately blitz the leader down. We do have the bonus to double our movement so we can get there. The thing is they have guards, these hoodlums standing in the open areas in between the poison and the fire. The thing is that fire only damages you if you end your turn on top of the fire. You can run through it and be just fine. So. We're gonna try and use that to our advantage and just see how crazy this opening turn can get. Actually, oh, there's a foot soldier, good. Mr. Foot Soldier, you will take a sacrificial place uh, over here somewhere. Now we're ready to go for it. All right, run up, pick up the spear, chuck it at the leader. Yeah, he's definitely going down. Okay, now we want to rush through, but be careful so that we don't touch the poison because the poison will stick with you, the fire will not. So there we go, burning is off. You only get burning if you end your turn on top of fire or next to somebody else who is burning. 
Unfortunately, because we completely removed their armor already, we lose the bonus damage on Pound. So we'll go for the weakening blow here. Oh, it's a crit. All right, do it again, tough. Every single refugee leader is taking it to the face. Incredible stuff. And now we just have to deal with these hoodlums. I feel like the people of Tiltran should erect a statue to Tuff or something. Something to recognize her incredible service. Okay, there we lost one of the little low health engagements. We won another one over here and Tuff is getting ganged up on. So time to be able to send assistance, I believe. We'll throw Jab around. Yes, if we can move them up. Honestly, probably the best thing for them is to throw off this hoodlum and be ready to make sure that they cannot engage down here. So we'll throw the impale, which is going to damage them. And then we will step up just to make sure that our spear wall connects. Now, if they move at all from that position, we will stab them again and keep them from moving any farther. That ability is so good. There, the poison just takes out one of the low health enemies. The mayoress, oh good, I was scared she was gonna walk into the poison. These poison clouds give you three stacks of poison, like just what just happened to this phalanx soldier. He walked through the cloud, gets three stacks. Three stacks is enough to deal 15% of your max health every turn. And yes, you can die if your health depletes, even if you still have an armor level. This battlefield certainly is the most interesting in terms of figuring out how you can use this awesome terrain to your advantage, but it's not necessarily the most challenging. You have so much help and the AI is just bad at figuring out how to maneuver around the terrain. Your worst fear is that your allies will do stuff like this, walk through the poison and then just die. Refugees are fighting to the death and I do respect them for that, but respect has never kept me from killing a man. Ah, uh, the refugee menace has been cleansed. People of Tiltran will be safe from these bandits. Coming in, flooding in from the border. We pick up all of their goods, no level ups this time, and we continue. Here we are, the Mayoress and Fergus. Alone and together at last. You disgust me. He has nothing to say to us, so we speak to the Mayoress. Any last words, ruffian? Why? Why won't you leave us in peace? In peace, why would we do such a thing? You've destroyed our farms, ransacked our villages, stolen our grain, and brought Edorian soldiers in your wake. You've done nothing but cause problems. We had no other choice. You refused to open your doors and take us in, and just as we were starting to rebuild the haven, you laid waste to the place. What? This ruin? That's enough. You won't survive the winter months if you stayed here. For your insolence and the trouble you've caused, I hereby condemn you to the gallows. As for those refugees, they must leave Tiltren or suffer the same fate. Ah, mercenaries. Words cannot express how grateful I am for your help. Thanks to you, the locals will rest easy tonight. Come back to visit the real Stormcap when you get a chance. We will welcome our saviors with open arms. Please accept these gifts from our craftsmen and merchants in consideration of your invaluable help. We have finished the Tiltran scenario. It is time to explore other regions, or no, no, no. It is time to see what else this region might have for us. Now that we have won the mission, we get a new dialogue from the mayoress. I'm very happy to see you. Finally, we can show you the true Stromkap, a thriving, peaceful, honest community. We have rid our streets of these wretched refugees. The Edoranians now know not to come here. And that's all. There's not too much going on here at the end of finishing the region. Now let's talk about the biggest combat encounters this zone of the map is going to offer. While the story missions do have some awesome combat, and it can be pretty challenging depending on how early and low leveled you are tackling those missions, they are by no means the hardest pieces of combat that you are going to face. We have the boss of the region, Matthias Lund, down here by the mill. We have the banded menace built up and centered around their lair here in the south. And then we have the trackers up in the north who will give us a very challenging hunt up against some interesting wolves. Let's tackle these and explain how they go. If you are going after Matthias Lund, you're going to want to make sure that you pick up the bounty for him because it's going to show you exactly where on the map to head out and he is going to be worth a pretty penny when you bring him down. 
Now, you can take him on at a fairly early level once you understand how his encounter works. It is very much a puzzle encounter that if you can crack the code on how he plays, you will be able to take him down pretty easily uh, with some patience depending on how low level your characters are. Now, as we pull up the map, we see that Matthias is down here. The Lund farm is further up the trail right over here. If you show up here, you'll be able to speak with his wife who fills you in on a little bit of the backstory of this character. A group of bandits came in. They did not resist, but the bandits killed the family's daughter anyway. Filled by rage, Matthias went storming after them and caught up with them around the mill. And if you visit the mill, then you can witness his carnage as he took out all of the bandits. You can loot this area, but there is one lone survivor. So now we have to decide, do we want to finish Matthias's job and be able to gain some crowns and influence, or are we going to let this guy off easy? I've usually always killed him, so I'm going to see what healing him does. Hopefully it's not a waste of a medicine. Thank you. I can't believe that Ricky used us as a bait. He was the one to blame, not us. If he hadn't killed that little girl to steal her necklace, her father wouldn't have fought back and my friends would still be alive. Take me with you. I have a score to settle with that traitor. So we can recruit this guy to be able to help us fight against Matthias. We'll go ahead. Welcome to the band, Hackert. Welcome to the band. Now, Hackert is a level 3 ranger, actually very fortunate <laughs> for my particular band to be able to pick him up because uh, I've been looking for a ranger character. That is one of the classes I've been missing, so there we go. And level 3 is pretty solid. And here is Matthias. He will just kind of patrol around this field. He will not aggro you, so you can walk right up to him and engage him at your leisure. Lucilla, I will kill them all. Wanted for a string of murders, Matthias Lund is a dangerous individual. Champion level four. Here we go. It is nothing personal, Matthias. It's just business. You are about to become my largest paycheck. So let's break down how Matthias is going to operate. And then let's say goodbye to our boar friends because they are guaranteed to die in this encounter. Be very careful. Don't expect to bring a lot of animal companions in this and have any of them survive. Matthias, as a champion here, can use more than one skill in a given round. So his abilities are interspersed in the turn order here. And he is going to take effectively six actions, but it's going to look like three different turns spread out throughout the turn order. He is wielding Lucilla's Revenge as his basic attack. He has this wide zone that he targets, and then on the next turn, he's going to deal a Haymaker doing 150 damage to everybody in the zone and knocking them back six meters. So this is quite the swing from the meanest looking hammer you're going to find in the game. Then he also has Lucilla's Judgment. This is where he judges the nearest enemy, and that is going to be the enemy that he is going to move towards and try and target. So here we see he starts with Judgment, and then here he will move over to try and target them. Then he will swing and cast Judgment again, etc., etc. So the dance with Matthias is to always let the enemy that he is going to move toward still have a turn in the turn order so they can move away and then he will target somebody else, move towards them, and you keep on daisy chaining Matthias around, and you should never even take damage. I'll explain it as we play through it. The final piece to know is that Matthias is uncontrollable. This unit cannot be engaged or knocked back. Also, status effects will only apply to him at the end of his final turn. So if you think that poison or bleed is going to be a quick way to cut him down to nothing because he takes so many turns, that's not really true. What we want to do here is have our units nicely spread out around Matthias and then effectively move in, poke, and move out to make sure that we stay safe. So we're going to go ahead and shoot him. Now he cannot be, he doesn't suffer any knockbacks himself as a champion. I'm not sure what, what status is giving him that. He can use more than one skill, cannot be engaged or knockback. There it is. It is the uncontrollable trait. So back to snipe, we are going to run him away because we don't want him being targeted now that he's had his turn because if he was targeted he would not still be able to get out of the way and would take a haymaker to the face now it wouldn't kill him outright he would go to dying we would be able to bring him back um, but it's still a situation that we want to avoid so there we go judgment has been cast on axe this means that we want to wait to use axe until matthias runs right up to him and actually targets him this means that we can come in 
and layer in some damage with some of our other characters. Just start whittling him down. As you see, he's got an enormous pool of armor and a tremendous pool of health. It really helps if you have, I believe it is the warrior. There is a class that can go, no, I think it's the Swordmaster. You get Debilitating Strike, which will reduce this 30% re damage reduction that he's getting from his armor. Uh, that will help you a lot in cutting through this armor, but as it is, we just have to be patient. The boars are coming in to sacrifice their life. We have our new, hmm, who do I want to go next? We'll probably pull, yeah, we'll pull the other archer. He'll come up, make his shot and then move out of the way. Now Matthias comes up, targets. This is our cue to leave. So unfortunately, a lot of my Valor Point generation is all tied up in actually engaging enemies and because Matthias will never engage with us, uh, we are going to be a little stripped for um, Valor Points. We want to be very careful in terms of how we pick those up. But it also means that you always have the freedom to be able to run your unit away, which is what makes this combat possible. So there, he had his targeting, but we moved out of the way, so he's not able to target us again. And here he targeted the Colossus enemy, the boar with judgment, and he moved forward to target them. And unfortunately, we chose a clumsy position to place Axe, so Axe is still in the zone. You also want to focus on clearly not making the mistakes I do and spacing your units out a little bit farther so that he's only able to target one at a time. Now we can see that he is going to get this attack and then he is going to judge another character, so he's gonna judge the nearest character and try and target them, uh, which is probably, let's see, is it going to be Axe? Probably is. We're gonna go up and we're just gonna try and backstab him here. Hey, we got the crit, that's nice. And then we'll move out and make sure that we keep our spacing better. Here comes the swing. 187 damage because he also crit. And he knocks us back so far that he comes all the way over here and he targets this guy. Now this guy's already taken his turn this round but we get one turn at the beginning of the next round to be able to pull him out of harm's way. So we're gonna have to make sure that we do that. Now we are going to go ahead, we don't want any dead weight, so we will heal Axe up here. <laughs> and we can come around and try and get some chip damage in. We can also galvanize the troops here. And then we want to run away trying to get as much spacing between us as we can. Hopefully we didn't end up too close together there. I'm a little worried now. The new round has started, so I hope that the dance is starting to make itself clear. I'm gonna talk through this second round as well, but then I'm just gonna speed things up and end the combat because it gets pretty repetitive. It's just chipping through his enormous health pool here. Thankfully, the bleed is doing 20% of his max health as damage every turn, which is helping speed things up a lot. So we are gonna run, ooh, where do I wanna go? I wanna go far away, probably over to this side because the boar is going to be dead and then he's going to judge either of these characters and go over to try and attack them. So if we run opposite, then we should be able to keep Stab out of the rest of um, this round of battle. So there goes the boar, and who's he gonna judge? He is going to judge Tough. Then he's going to come and he's going to open up targeting. It looks like he is able to hit both of them. So we have a critical path here. We have to get both of them out of the way and then also far enough away from him. Ah, oh, this is gonna get awkward. Far enough away from him that he does not retarget them. There's no shame in just basically wasting a character's turn to get into a better position because uh, Matthias is quite the trick to deal with. All right, let's throw him pale. Get a little bit of damage. Now, what were the details of uncontrollable again? I keep checking this. It cannot be engaged or knocked back. Well, what about this? Spear wall targets a specific area. When the enemy enters the area, performs one attack of opportunity and stops them in their tracks. I assume Spear Wall would still work against him to keep him from moving around, but 
Uh, I just want to run away. I am Matthias, you are all alone here. And now he has judged Axe. Okay, Axe still has a turn. Good, good. I was like, he's back up. Is he going to go down? What a terrible demonstration for all the people watching the guide. I think we will take this chance just to kind of move in with the archerers and be able to get some chip damage in. Start whittling away at that health bar. He's not so tough when you have your entire gang up against him alone. It's a little unfair. Just a little unfair. There we go, he's going after Axe, and so for the end of this round, he is going to judge and go after one more person, but he's not going to be able to get another attack after that. So let's see what Axe is able to do. Oh, I want to do so much. I want to do so much. I want to move back. I want to throw that, but don't try and do too much here. So we're going to step up, use the Arm of Justice, Use the Rampage. Let's start bringing him down very low here. Use Wrath. And honestly, Bleeding should put the nail in the coffin. And then we'll just run out. We might have even been able to finish him off with the Spear Throw as I look at it now. Yeah, I could have. Interesting. Okay, let's pile on for the finish. All right, Hackert, you said you wanted revenge. Now take it. Take it in your own hands. Oh, we get the animation of the backstab too. There it is. That's how you defeat Matthias Lund. Honestly, not my cleanest battle against him. Um, but hopefully it got the idea through on how you'll be able to beat them. If you are more precise in the dance with Matthias, you'll be able to tackle this even with much lower level characters. And we have acquired Lucilla. The legendary hammer of Matthias Lund, strength plus 14. A war hammer with a handle wrapped in human skin. And then you get the exact same attack that Matthias was using to absolutely level our company. So use this. It is a fun puzzle piece. Um, it is challenging to be able to get off consistently because of the turn delay. Um, what I often find is if you give it to a character, you want them to go last in the initiative so that then they can go first in the next initiative and be able to catch out a group of enemies with the devastating attack be able to do a lot of damage there the level of this hammer and matthias is geared toward the average level of your companions so if you tackle this early he will be a little bit easier and the axe will also be not this great stat line lucilla level four so if you wait and tackle him later then the rewards will be greater with matthias dealt with the next combat we are going to show off is following the highland trackers hunt here in tiltran I will say fighting the Ghost Hunt is probably the most challenging combat encounter that you are going to find here in Tiltran, and I will be showing that off. If the transition looks a little jumpy when we get into that combat, it'll be because it, you don't get to control when you actually fight them. They just have a random chance of spawning every single night. So we will see when we encounter them and if we are able to make the most of our battle with the Spectres. The Highland Trackers are right here, right at the Snow Line, up in the corner of the map. They are an incredibly important group to be able to find because they will give you the map. Oh, there's the ghosts. Oh, there's the ghosts. Okay. Hang on to the... Hang on, Trackers. We have the real most dangerous hunt to engage with. So, the Ghost Spectres will have a chance of appearing every night. I believe it's not completely random, and they have some bias to appearing within a zone that you will be able to see. Here, Ghost, the Phantom Swarm. Your companions have just ambushed their targets and will have an advantage in the fight. How did we ambush the ghosts? Ghost Wolves, five. Phantom Boars, five. And then there is also going to be a Nightmare that will appear partway through the fight. Let's get into this. We do battle with the ghosts in the snowy peaks of the mountains. 
So this is a mix of both ghost wolves and phantom boars. The boars are the same as usual, defensive below, they do the damage to the target. When their friends die, they gain fury, meaning their next attack does more damage. The wolves, just like other wolves, do bite damage to the target, um, I believe, yes, sharp fang. So each attack against the unit without armor will apply bleeding, and bleeding does 20% of your target's max health at the end of their turn, which is devastating. Also, all of the specters have terrifying presence. So when they attack one of your guys, they will gain stacks of terror. And once they hit five stacks, they just flee the battlefield. But when you kill a specter, then the terror stacks get rolled back by one. So you need to be consistently able to keep on rolling through the uh, the animals. They're going to get reinforcements every single turn. This is a brutally hard fight. Let's see how well we do. We also do not get perfect visibility on this map. You have this spectral fog out here. So actually, if you move through that, then you get a stack of terror and you will have to end your turn inside the fog. So usually you can spend all of your movement in any order. You can move and then attack and then move again, but that's not true in this case. Hunting ghosts in the night, ectoplasm gleaming, terror spreading through the fight, and my friends are fleeing. Round one has actually gone really well for us, but here come all the enemy reinforcements, and they seem to be arrayed entirely on this side of the map. Very unbalanced, but hopefully it means that they kind of get caught up on each other and uh, do not take very efficient turns. Let's see, what do I want Jab to do here? I think he just needs to fend the wolf back and then go for the spear wall. As much as I would like to be able to run back and be able to get galvanized up, we're going to save that for when our valor points are a little bit lower. Let's see, what are the other plays we want to make? Twang... Ah, uh, my character names are so dumb, I named them after their weapons. The nightmare has just appeared, so round three is where the battle really takes off. There he is, the nightmare. This is the leader of the spectral haunt. His basic attack is a Binding Terror. We see it has an enormous radius here, deals 11 damage to the target's health, and applies Binding of Terror to the target and a random companion. Binding of Terror, this unit takes three terror at the end of their turn, but it is removed when next to an ally affected by this effect. So if we can get the two terrorized guys next to each other, I think that means that we can just cleanse it. And then again, the terror, if it reaches five stacks, we just lose the character. They run away. Also, the nightmare is the stuff of nightmares. Every time this unit takes damage, it applies one terror to the attacker. So we need to be careful. If we just pile on damage all onto it, our units will all gain a lot of stacks of terror. So we are in a sticky situation. Sticky situation to say the least. We'll kill this ghost wolf here with jab. And we'll walk back toward the safety, relative safety, of our friends. Galvanize the troops. Jab is our leader. And then we'll throw up this spear wall. Hopefully to be able to protect when one of these boar attacks. I don't know, it's such a small radius. Hopefully that catches one of them. It will get a attack of opportunity against them and stop them in their tracks. So, try and get as much as we can out of that. Now this wolf is going to go, but we already set up the uh, overwatch here. Able to drop him. Very nice to see. I think all we do here is slip forward and poke with the archer and then uh, back up a little. Keep our guys safe. Let the enemies come into us. We have all our overwatch abilities. There we go. So it does prevent this attack. like to see it. Now this boar is going to go and who's next on the order? The guy in front of him. So they're going kind of in reverse of what they would like to be able to do. But... How do we want to juggle this? I think we let Axe come in and just go insane. Because he can use Wrath here. Be able to get his Fury stack. And then he can move in to here. And we go Arm of Justice. Or do we go straight into... Yeah, Arm of Justice. And then Rampage. After. The pig's bane. <laughs> you are the bane of the pigs, Axe. How do you feel? Are you proud of yourself? Is this really what you thought you would do with your life when you joined a mercenary company? <laughs> uh. 
Okay, we spend all of the Overwatch points, and I feel like this barrage is points well spent. So we will do the basic attack, be able to push this boar back, and then we will reactivate barrage. Hoping to be able to catch some of these other animals moving. Ah, the tip just misses. Okay, that's okay. I want to deal with the Nightmare, but he's last in the initiative and he's so far out, he's gonna move towards us and then apply his terror. But I also don't want the numbers to get out of hand of the rest of the ghosts. So we are kind of uh, locked in here. Here comes the Nightmare. Oh, wow, he doesn't even move. Are you kidding? He just goes straight, he hits half of Hackert's health. Binding Terror, who else got Binding Terror? One of the, yeah. Okay, Twang got Binding Terror. So, we have to move these guys next to each other to prevent getting three stacks of Terror just immediately. Thankfully, he did not call in any more reinforcements though. So, let's see. Is the play, what is the play? This guy's going next. We probably want to keep him from being able to get any extra damage off, so we'll do that, and then if we can pick up any extra kills with Stab, he earns Valor points. Both of these guys are pretty low, so let's line them up for a brilliant spear throw. The Harpooner class is oh so good. <laughs> yes, basket in the power. Now we get to take a lot of turns in a row here. Bring up my range. Can I get in? Yes, I can even reach out and poke the nightmare from here. So we'll do it. And that will give us an extra stack of terror here onto Twang, but because he is next to the other there, it got cleansed off. So he has terror, but he does not have a binding terror. Basically the binding is that the two have to come together. Otherwise you get a heavy, heavy penalty. Yeah, hacker, you beautiful. Finish it off with a crit. And unfortunately, the, you may, I wish we could move the Nightmare. All right, we're just gonna swing you probably around here, be able to give us some spacing. Axe, you, you are able to draw the Nightmare out at least a little bit with the Arm of Justice. So we'll go for this. Engage the Nightmare. Now we have two stacks of terror because we attacked it twice. We did the pull and then we did the uh, the extra attack. So maybe we actually wanted to spread out our damage against the nightmare and a damage against the other guys to be able to cleanse some of these terror stacks. I want to be able to use rampage against it, but that will guarantee that Axe is going to flee the battle. So uh, I think that we are going to hold off and let some of our other allies chip in the damage. Just pass the turn here. Hmm, maybe pushing the Nightmare <laughs> into the Terror Fog was not the best move. But it's not like our other guys were really in position to be able to do anything with this anyway. He didn't even come out of the fog? Are you kidding? We'd have to go into the fog to find him? Yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Any hit, poor Hackard again. Okay. Fine, foul fiend. I will play your game. So there we cleansed the terror and we're just going to back away at this point. There he comes. Show yourself, beast. And he goes again for axe. And he applied it to tough. Okay. Okay, so these guys need to get next to each other somehow is what you're telling me? They take three terror at the end of their turn and is removed when next to an ally affected by this effect. So if Axe takes the effect, he flees the battle. Axe can get to up here with his movement. I think he could go a little farther if we move Twang out of the way. So take your pod shot, my friend, and then get out of the way.
Now, how far can Axe get? Axe can go all the way. Okay, brilliant. Our goal here is to pile on and finish the nightmare, um, but still play smart, not leave any openings. We'll do the double attack here and hold off from doing an extra attack because that fifth terror would cause Axe to just flee. No, I'm actually going to, uh, what do I do? He's only got a few health. We'll push him. Ah, the crit from Snipe brings him down. And there we have triumphed over the ghost hunt. Tough becomes a duelist. What does the duelist give us? There we are. Critical hit and critical damage increased by 5% when a one-handed weapon is equipped. Making her even more preposterously lethal. Ooh, red eyeballs. Its vivid red color is nauseating. Ugh. And white leather, an odd type of leather, which is exceptionally tough despite its silky texture. We have skinned our ghost hunt, and these materials are used for crafting the highest level of weapons in the game to be able to make your steel tier. So you start out being able to craft iron weapons, and then if you want to go up to steel, you are going to need white leather. So... Getting used to how you handle fighting the ghosts, they can appear in any region, so they still made it into the guide for this region because they are such a cool fight and such an important piece for being able to do high-level crafting. Man, doing the hunt that the trackers is going to give us is going to feel like such a letdown after, <laughs> after fighting the ghosts. So... What we were coming here to do, up on the world map, we have the trackers up here in the north. They are going to give us the mission Shika's Fangs. So I'm just showing off that you have to go here first. I've actually already picked up the hunt. If you speak to the master tracker, Brennan, he is going to give you the info for the hunt. Come back victorious, or do not come back at all. That's all he has to say for us, but he's going to give you the map to be able to get in on the hunt. We've got some mutton over here for stealing. Equally as amazing as the quest that you can pick up from the Master Tracker, Brennan is talking to Hunter Bega because she has an incredibly unique shop. Here you are able to spend the animal teeth that you have been collecting from all of the animal encounters you've had thus far on her very unique set of items. You can buy traps here, which will catch small animals as you rest, bringing in a little bit of food as you are traveling for the party, but they are only single use, and I do not recommend spending your teeth there because there are so much more valuable things that you can pick up from this shop. Here we see we can get unique blueprints of things that we can craft, either a meat drying rack, which will be something that we can add to the campsite, a sharp fang, which is going to be a medallion like it will attach to the belt, I believe, of your characters and fill that kind of slot. And then we also have reinforced layers, which are armor augments that we can get. Let's see if we can show off how this works. Here, Twang is wearing rags. This is the base level of armor you are able to craft, and it has these two spots, armor layer available. If you buy and learn these blueprints, then you are able to craft augments that you can slot in to these armor layers, and they are very, very good stat boosts to be able to get your party really optimized. I'm going to have to do a little bit of save scumming to be able to go through all of these because I only have 300 teeth right now, but let's see what they all do. First up, the two blueprints, purchase and purchase. These are good for your blacksmith, and you have a blacksmith novice and blacksmith novice. So these will be craftable without any experience on your blacksmith. Defender's reinforced layer is costing iron ore, leather, and raw materials, and it is an enhancement used by defenders from Harig to update their armor, adding three armor values. So you'll be able to bump up the armor values just a little bit. Not too exciting, but still a significant stat boost if you want to really optimize your party. Stag's reinforced layer gets a little bit more interesting using leather, grease, and again, raw materials. Sages always choose mobility over power. Movement plus one, so this can really open up being able to position your units very carefully and get them into the exact engagements that you want. Next we have our two blueprints. These are good for your tinkerer, so they can be made just out of your campsite at any time. We have 
the Sharp Fang and Meat Drying Rack. Let's see what these give us. Sharp Fang is a belt accessory gaining a critical hit against the bleeding targets increased by 10%. So critical hit is separate from critical damage. This means that your chance to crit against the bleeding target goes up by 10%. It would be great on a character who is automatically applying bleed and that can really boost up your damage. It costs leather a lot of sandstone and one pristine fang. So you actually use, you use the currency to buy these also to craft this, but not very much. Let's craft the drying rack and see exactly what it is going to bring and what's going to add to the campsite. So we can smack it down, position it as we like. Just a little <laughs> real simple. Didn't, didn't see why we needed to go to the, uh, the trackers to be able to figure out how to build this. So what is going to happen here is you add your meat and then you are going to be able to gain cured meat. True connoisseurs savor this a delicacy in parchment thin slices. So the ratio here is we're using grilled pork. We're gonna try it on raw uh, meat in a second once we are able to acquire a little bit more. But basically we have six units of food and 1.4 pounds worth of food over here. And then over here, we have eight units of food in only 0.8. Pounds. So it is both an increase in how much food you have, and it is also a decrease in the amount of weight that your food is taking up. So honestly, I could see you building multiples of these if you grab the resources to be able to do it and keep on converting your meats, all of your hunting products into these cured meats because these are incredibly efficient in terms of carry weight, which can often be a uh, annoyance when you don't want to spam out a lot of ponies. The meat drying rack is also able to handle fish, so here we are putting in two eels, four units of food, and two pounds, and converting that into six units of food and only 0.6 pounds. So it is going to continually be making your meat products more and more efficient. Now to actually launch the hunt that the trackers gave us. So they gave us this with a little paw print, the Tiltron Hunt. According to the report, someone was attacked near the local stables. All points to the giant she-wolf, Sika. We have been hunting for several weeks now. And you are told to pick up the trail from the huntsman that there is a victim right outside the stable. So this is new. We can inspect the body. Parts of the corpse are horribly mangled. Only an animal could tear off such large chunks of flesh. And here we now get a trail of blood. We're able to track Sheikah and her her band. She leads us on a merry chase through the countryside, and I see the wolf pack now. And here they come out to meet us, actually. So there are two bands of wolves. One ganked us, and I got through those, but this one you can clearly tell with Shika is the boss. These wolves are guaranteed to be leveled to your party, so if you like picking up animal companions, definitely have some rope ready. These are going to be the wolves that you are guaranteed to get a lot of value out of if you recruit them. The wolves have us surrounded, and there is Sika, the great warg, leading her pack. So she is the leader, strength and dexterity and constitution increased by 30%. Ferocious Bite deals 23 to 29 damage to the target. Critical hit guaranteed if the target is bleeding. Oh my goodness. Now you unfortunately are not allowed to capture and tame Sika herself, but you could capture and tame any of her pack members and they are guaranteed to be leveled to the average level of your party. So if you like picking up a lot of animal companions, you're going down the Beastmaster class for your archers. These are going to be prime candidates to be added to the party. The plan here is thin the herd and then worry about Sika and whatever nastiness she is going to bring against us. Because she's going fairly late in the order, she'll naturally just come to us and then we should be able to capitalize. Let's go for a tactical order here on tough. Drop that wolf and the battle continues. All right, the trap has been laid for Sika. She's going to want to go after Jab, but he is going to stab her to hold her in place and that's gonna all happen within the overwatch. So we should be able to manage her assault quite nicely. Is the one and into the other. Oh, I do love it when a plan comes together. So being able to contain her so she doesn't get those extra damaging bites off is going to be key. And then also making sure that you watch what targets are bleeding so that she doesn't get those guaranteed crits is also going to be very beneficial in this battle. She's 
Stab has become a Tormentor, and we're able to pick up. Unfortunately, you don't get any, like, legendary loot out of Sika, but there we go. We have completed the Tracker's Quest. Time to go back to their camp and report in. Back up the trail to the trackers, speaking with the master tracker. Interesting, very interesting. A hunt worthy of a tracker. To think you've accomplished this feat with such flimsy armor. And so then he says you will need to upgrade your armor with layers. And he gives us this free blueprint. And we get one reinforced layer of the stag. So he gives us a free armor upgrade and a blueprint for another one. And he tells us to find the Brotherhood in all of the other regions for some more extraordinary hunts. We get to learn reinforced layer of the stag. This is a very high quality piece of armor. It gives you both armor and strength, but it is going to require some of that ultra rare ghost skin, the white leather. So spend your leather very wisely when it comes to that white leather, but this could definitely be a fair candidate giving you armor four and strength two. For somebody who's using strength as their primary source of damage, getting a little bit of extra strength is always amazing. You also want to be careful spending these reinforced layers that you craft because once they are assigned to a piece of armor, they're there permanently. You can remove them from the armor, but that will destroy them. You would do that in a situation where you want to apply a different reinforcement for this particular piece of armor. But because you're continually leveling up and thus wanting to find higher level gear for your characters, you're probably going to end up tossing the armor and then wanting to put and have to craft new layers for the the new armor that you're putting on your characters. That being said, while Tuff is probably our best candidate to be getting the boost to her strength and armor value, she's only rocking level 1 armor right now, and so somebody with a higher level piece of armor that we are likely going to keep around longer is going to serve us better. Also, some pieces of armor don't have any options for these extra layers, so you have to balance all of this when you're trying to pick the gear for your characters. Our next showcase of unique combat takes us to the rat infestation. So we have two locations of rat infestation, one down here all the way in the south and one down here all the way in the north. This one is right next to the Gozenberg border crossing, but we're going to do this one. They are both going to play out the same. You're going to want to make sure that you have at least a few cures for the plague in inventory, depending on how adventurous or how much you trust your skill. You might want to stock up on even more than this, because if one of your characters is infected and you are not not able to cure them before the next rest, then they will be plagued and at that point they are uncurable as far as I am aware. These encounters will reward you with unique crafting supplies and materials, but they will not give you very much in the way of monetary compensation, so you can often find contracts available in the inn to take these down, and I would recommend waiting until you have those to be able to do these. Here we are on a subterranean battlefield with the little plague rats gathered around their hideous brood mother. There is a lot going on with this battle, so let's break it all down before we dig into anything. We have the brood mother is the centerpiece of the battle. Her death will end the battle. You get a nifty little tooltip up here. Her initiative, I believe, is always going to be last every single round, and her ability is that she is going to call in reinforcements through these holes that you see in the ground. They blend in a little bit, but you should be able to mark them, and that's where all of her reinforcements are going to come from. Every single round, she's going to call in additional rats. The number is going to be increased by one, so their numbers will gradually overwhelm you if you are not careful. If we look at the specs of the Plague Rat, they are not too scary on their own, but their attacks are infected. They deal fever, which can stack on your units, and that means that unit is more susceptible to future sources of damage. Finally, we have the Plague Infected Outgrowths. These seem like something that you can ignore. They are spamming out a poison cloud all around them, and they have all these effects. Cloud of Poison applies to poison to any unit that walks through the cloud or ends their turn within it. Poison, the stacks here, uh, are actually, it is poisoned itself, and then it has pyrophobia. So all of these creatures, the plague infected outgrowths, the plague rats, and the brood mother are considered plagued organisms. They have pyrophobia, meaning they take double damage from sources of fire, so bring in your torches or specialized weapons that will be able to do fire damage to really bring them to their knees, and poison damage actually heals them. So go to your rogue and unequip all those poison weapons, which I forgot to do, so... Haggard here is actually going to be healing them if they survive his initial stab. 
Because these little rats go down so easily, my game plan here is to leverage the archers to drop the plague infected outgrowths without having to step into the poison while the rest of my group holds off the vermin horde and hopefully whittles down the brood mother so if things get hairy we can just kill her and end the battle. Now that I have laid out such a clean and concise game plan, let's see how well it holds together when I get punched in the face by a bunch of plagued rats. What is the movement on these rats? And oh my gosh, they have great movement. 15 spaces of movement. The brood mother you see has no movement. She will never move. She will never engage you in combat. She will not attack. She just calls out more of her babies to do away with you. Ugh, she is hideous. See, one bite is not too dangerous, but uh, as the fever stacks, it is going to get worse and worse for us. Okay, what is the next play? Let's see how well our archers are able to bite in. Okay, that's where the poison cloud begins. I don't want to be too close to this rat hole because that's going to where that's going to be where the reinforcements will spam out from. So if we keep our archers over here, we should be relatively safe. And uh, we'll see how long it takes to actually cut through this. It has a lot of health. You really want to have fire damage on it to be able to get through it. I believe it is, oh, what are they? It's not the deserters. There's gonna be a class of enemies that have bomber archers that do fire damage out of the bows. And if you can loot one of those bows, you're going to be in a great place. Hey, we got bleeding applied to the brood mother. So that is gonna put a timer on the battle. Bleeding will remove 20% of the target's health. Nothing to, uh, nothing to sneer at. Here comes her call for reinforcements. Come, my babies. Consume these intruders. And they all swarm out. How many of them are near the archers? Only three. Okay. Ooh, a new round is starting. The sun is setting. The rats are going feral. Rage damage is increased by 30%. So if you let this battle drag on, they can go insane. I guess you also need to be careful of what time you engage them. What time of day? Ooh, that is an extra wrinkle that I wasn't even aware of. The ranks of rats are growing ever more numerous. These are definitely challenging encounters, depending on how bold you are trying to be to be able to pick up these valuable crafting supplies. And I really want to be able to showcase what we get, so we're going to keep going till we drop one of those outgrowths. Also remember you can use first aid to remove the stacks of fever. I would recommend only doing so if the stacks are getting a little bit out of hand. Just one stack is not something to worry about, but they do add up quick. And especially when the plague rats have rage going on, then their damage is starting to be meaningful. Oh, nine health left on the plague infected outgrowth. That means we have to survive one more round. So we make it to the end of this initiative, we use our archers, drop the outgrowth, and then dogpile the broodmother, if at all possible. I think we're in a decent enough situation uh, to be able to engineer that scenario. Ooh, there, plague-infected wound. So finally, the uh, the plague rats are taking their hand onto these guys. Oh, they're both plague-infected. Oh, how did it get to both of them? And a third plague-infected wound. Things are coming against us. Not to mention even more rats. Now it is 7 to 20 in terms of the uh, balance of power here. There's only 9 health remaining on this plague infected outgrowth. And Twang's damage ranges from 7 to 12. Please, oh please, I've never wanted a high roll so bad. No, we got a 7. Are you kidding me? Desperate times call for desperate measures. All right, tough. You're gonna end this. You're gonna go wrath into the plague rat. You are then going to run into the cloud of poison and take your hammer to the face of this plague infected outgrowth. It crumbles. A nest has been destroyed and then the poison actually goes away. It's there, one of seven nests. Amazing. So we had one over here, one over here. One over here, you can just keep on going. One of seven, I only see four. Maybe it's across the entire region and there are three in the other nested area. Interesting. Now it's all in on the brood mother to be able to bring this to an end. So what is the best damage combination we can find? I think we use impale here from jab. Kill that rat, 
and then that frees up Stab as long as none of the other rats decide that they can go. Though this one is going to want to come down and engage. Ah, oh, it's so annoying. First aid does not cure the plague infected wound. That will only be cured by the cure for the plague that you can purchase from the alchemists. We used our phalanx wall to be able to stop that rat in his tracks. And now, Stab, you're going to have to climb over all of these hideous rat bodies. Be able to get in position to stab the brood mother. Yes. Chuck the spear right into her heart. She falls, and that should end the combat right there. The brood mother is dead, the rats are fleeing in panic. Your companions killed 21 rats and destroyed one plague-infected growth. So we get plagued leather. A strange aura emanates from this piece of leather. Perhaps someone knows how to refine it. I've not found exactly where you can refine this into leather or use it for unique materials, but it is clearly a unique material for you. Then you have infected blood. You have rats which you can eat. You have all the fangs. This is probably one of the best places to be able to pick up fangs for the, um, the hunters. Red Eyes Plague Infected Outgrowth Sample. This is going to be useful for some of your crafting. And the Infected Brain is going to be valuable to the Alchemists. And then the Carcass, I think you only get one Carcass because, well, that's either the Plague Infected Outgrowth or that is the Brood Mother's body that you have dragged to the surface. Why we would ever think that we wanted to do such a thing, I don't know. Now we want to cure our Plague Infected Wounds. Uh, it's a good thing I brought three of these. It, we ended up needing all of them. You're going to want to go into these rat battles with clear intentions of how many materials you want to bring out because once you kill that brood mother, then the encounter is gone. You can't go back there to be able to pick up more crafting materials later, though you will get more options on other locations in that same zone and in the future zones you'll be able to find more ways to be able to pick up those materials. Just want to be careful because they are not a renewable resource. Back here at the Apothecary, we can start to see the value of these unique crafting items. The Infected Brain can be traded to receive Strength Oil or Sharpening Oil. The Strength Oil is crafted from Pristine Essence, Comfrey, and Pristine Fang, which takes us over to Pristine Essence, which is where you use the Plague Infected Outgrowth Sample. So, those samples are going to be key for being able to get these higher level oils activated. The effect is that every time a skill deals damage, it has a 20% chance to increase the strength for three rounds. Absolutely insane on characters who have special abilities that allow them to attack multiple times, a la Axe. Our Berserker, who has the skill Rampage, three times dealing damage, so he can do damage up to five times in a turn, which if this 20% chance is accurate, then he is almost guaranteed to increase his strength on that round. The other option, the Sharpening Oil, will gain a critical hit plus 10%, so an extra 10% chance of being able to apply crit. Also incredibly powerful, this one requiring the Pristine Essence, Salt, and two copies of Alizarian Powder, which I actually have not been able to find out in the world yet. For our final set of the combat locations, let's talk about the bandits. So the bandit forces in Tiltran are centered around their lair down here in the southwest. This difficulty of this encounter is very hard. They have a ton of defenders right here, but you can weaken them. It will give you a little tooltip that says you can weaken them by attacking their friends that have to be nearby. Now that doesn't mean that they're just hiding out in the forest over here, which I initially thought. What it means is if you wipe out their other lair locations, which are here at Mount Altrus Tower and down here in the old lighthouse, then you will be able to weaken the defenders down here at their final lair. When you take over these locations, they will give you plans to their lair so that you can get this location revealed or you can pick up the quest and you'll be able to find it as well. You will often also be given bounties to liberate the old lighthouse or Mount Altrus Tower here, and I highly recommend that you go through all of these because the bandits have stashed some really great great loot here at their locations. 
I have already liberated the old lighthouse here. We have just freed Mount Altris Tower. So let's piece over what we've been able to find here. I see one chest here that is locked and one chest down here that is locked. And I wish that they didn't have you playing the adventure game mouse and click over everything to find all the loot in these kind of locations. But that is what it is. Let's see what's inside these chests. Nothing too special behind the first one there. And now let's pick this final lock. That lock was being very finicky, so hopefully we have something interesting here. And here are the big rewards. We have the whetstone case, a belt item that will increase damage of attacks from behind by 5%. Absolutely beautiful to have on your rogue characters. If you're getting a lot of damage out of your rogues, this is their dream item. Adjustable straps, we've already seen this, increasing the movement, and a military report. Reading this book will give us a knowledge point. These bandit locations usually have these kind of unique rewards that you're not going to be able to find anywhere else, so that is why I highly recommend going through all of them. Here we are at last, approaching the bandit's ultimate lair. We see the skulls right above it, and so they will be filled in, all three of them will be filled in when you first come to the area. If you have not cleared out the other hideouts, that means it is going to have a ton of defenders in there. Because we have cleared out the defenders, two of the skulls, if you notice, have been grayed out. And so they are down to one difficulty out of three, one star out of three stars, however you want to think about it. And... <laughs> Having the difficulty reduced is fine by me because look at this. We are fighting 666, 18 level 4 enemies to be able to take out this lair. Alright, let's see how this encounter goes. The main trick to fighting overwhelming enemies is finding a position that you can fight them where there will be lots of enemies that are caught far away from the battle and will have to waste multiple turns to get involved. I don't know if this map is too conducive to that style of play because it seems like the enemies within the uh, around the areas where we are able to drop in most of our units are pretty close by. So not the best map spawn for us, but we will try and make the most of it. Our general game plan here is to collapse on these centrally located enemies. So we have five, nine enemies here. That's fighting them almost one to one. Oh, the odds are so against us. While the main bulk of the rest of their forces, or basically the other half of their forces, there's nine over here as well, are going to have to take multiple turns to kind of feed through this choke point. And hopefully they'll get gummed up on each other in here and have to waste even more turns to be able to get out because the turn order is randomized if they already have units here in the front and the units behind get their turns they'll just basically have to waste the turn hopefully a couple extra times things are mostly playing out as i hope they would we've leveled things to 7 to 13 we've been clearing out these bandits in the middle as you can see by all the dead bodies and blood in the snow which the graphics in this game oh they're so good. And most of the enemy reinforcements over here have been really hard pressed to figure out how to walk around this rock. So, <laughs> things I was swinging in our favor. This marauder is the scary piece over here. The rest of these are just archers or poachers. So we are going to see what we can do about this with axe here. Be able to get the engage attack of opportunity, the bonus attack here. Swing around and swing hard. Open up with rampage drop them down and then wrath should be able to seal the deal it does there we go took him out before he even got a turn that is how i like to play it then honestly we are going to back up a little bit because 15 health that is only two shots from the poachers and then they could be going down i want to get tough out of this battle with the po oh and the crit i wanted to pull them out and be able to get them into this hoodlum forcing these guys to keep on progressing towards us using Pound here because they still have one tick of armor. We get bonus damage. And then Wrath again, <laughs> sealing the deal. Oh, yes. Now, I wish that they had a few more animations for us, but that one is pretty great. Seven to seven and the bandits' bodies are really piling up. They still have a number caught up way outside of combat range. So now it's just a matter of making sure we win our engagements that are nearby and keeping track of which bandits are going next to try and deny as many turns as possible from the enemy side. Right now, Tough is just the uh, the one-man army. 
All these bodies are her and pretty much nobody else, which is kind of insane to think about. Another crazy thing to think about is this fight can absolutely be even harder if you choose to engage without picking off the other bandit outposts first, making this an just incredible challenge. Where the challenge is great, so too are the rewards. Let's pick over this layer and see exactly what all we find. Oh, ho, ho, already we found the whetstone. Critical hit increased by 10% during an attack from behind and a blueprint watchkeeping stool. The watchkeeping stool can be crafted by the tinkerer added to your camp, and then when you assign a party member, it will reduce the threat of being attacked as you are waiting through the night. Here we have found a blinding powder, giving you the blind ability, which will give an instant disengage. A whetstone case, damage of attacks from behind increased by 5%, so you either get the extra critical hit or you can get the extra damage. And we get the small gauntlet, a damage increase by 50%, but this unit can only use a base action, meaning that you are not allowed any of the fancy valor actions. Aw, oh, can you imagine using that gauntlet plus Lucilla's hammer? Or oh, the damage is just too big. The last thing is there's a dead bandit. There's a corpse in the campsite. Heckert immediately recognizes Ricky, his former accomplice, who had betrayed him. And we have Lucilla Lund's medallion. So this is unique. You only get this if you have recruited Heckert. And this is completing the Lund storyline. This is the guy who made the bandit's job go bad, killed the daughter to be able to grab this medallion, and that caused Matthias to go on the rampage. The final awesome tidbit for this location is that this is where you can meet an agent from the black market if you progress far enough down the path of crime and chaos. If we were able to reach level 4, we would have access to black market agents and the black market itself when you find it out there on the map. But the agent will appear here. He is pretty incredible. He gives knowledge tomes that you can buy and they contain knowledge of all of the basic skills that your characters can have. So just like Snipe here has run, you get tomes that would be able to teach any character any skill on top of the skills that they already have. This means that you can put Wrath on characters that are missing it, but you really want to have it, or you can put First Aid on extra characters. It's really incredible. And the Black Market Agent is also a location where you are able to fence stolen goods. If you guys were curious about the blinding powder and the exact application, it goes in the offhand position for your characters. So here I'd been giving Hecker the torch because it gives him additional critical hit. The vision and torque strike was not really something that I was utilizing, but this would mean that he would be able to instantly disengage at the cost of a valor point. So is that really worth it? Well, that's up to you guys. If you guys want to use it, I think I'm going to stick with the torch for now and we'll see how the battles play out. If I feel at any point that, oh, I really wish I had had a blinding powder to get him out of a situation, then I might go ahead and equip it for the future fights. Now, curiosity was really getting to me if now that we had Lucilla Lund's medallion and we returned to her mother, if there would be a special interaction. And sure enough, there is. We can give Lucilla Lund's medallion to her. And let's see how she reacts. What? You have Lucilla's necklace? You can't begin to understand how much this means to me. We get 80 crowns, 20 influence. I can't thank you enough. You deserve much more than this, but it's all I- Aw, you didn't have to give me all you had. I'm loaded. We're a very well-off mercenary company. But yes, may your daughter rest in peace and your husband too, knowing that we have fully avenged them. Oh, that is a lot of green check marks, and I absolutely love it. I must go and complete everything. The last few that we have can be knocked out fairly quickly, so let's get to it. Here at the Plateau Stables, if we pull up the map, they're just south of the town. This is probably the first location that everybody playing War Tales visits. And you get a quest here if the shoe fits. So what this is, is that if you purchase a pony, you will get the set of horseshoes for free. After you buy yourself your pony, simply talk to the man behind the table, Burris, and he'll say, please accept these horseshoes. You can also purchase more horseshoes if you want to stack the bonus. It is an animal accessory that gives you an additional 5% movement speed. Now remember, animal accessories, even though they seem to only make sense for the ponies, they can go on your wolves and boars as well. The same things with the saddlebags that you can craft with the Tinkerer. It is also truly hilarious to me that the ponies can get randomly assigned traits like Tormentor. 
Next, we are going north of town along the road to the Tiltron Lumber Mill. This is a very interesting location. Number one, it is great if you want to be able to steal a little bit of a lumber if you're short on crafting supplies. And number two, we get to talk to Ainz. She gives us a very guarded, I'm terribly sorry, mercenaries, but there's nothing of interest for you here. This is but a simple sawmill, and I am its humble owner, she says, as she conspicuously wears bandit robes. Well, there is a locked door here in the corner of the lumber mill requiring the use of the ornate key, so we must dig deeper. We pick up the ornate key back at old Wilbert's sheepfold, perhaps the reason that he was so cagey about allowing anyone else to stay there. If we use the key, it is expended from our inventory and we are able to go down. And here we see that she is keeping people down in the basement, refugees. Don't hurt me if they flog me one more time. This woman promised us honest labor and look what we got. We're treated worse than slaves. And the guard turns a blind eye. But then again, why would anyone help at Iranian refugees? Make sure that you grab the work manual out of the chest down here. I'm actually not sure if any of the rewards here are randomized or if that is always going to be there. But even if they're randomized, it's going to be something good for you. As you exit, Eins is mysteriously gone. She's seen us go down to the basement, doesn't want any part of this, and returns with a bandit company. Sadly for you, ransacking a slave's basement tends to be a bad idea. We can negotiate, costing us a little bit of influence, or we can put an end to slavery here in Tiltron. We've sided against the refugees so many times, I think it's time to actually do something to help them out. Once the slavers have been dealt with, you can head back into the lumber mill. It'll be completely abandoned. You can loot whatever you want. The refugees have disappeared, and that's the end of the encounter. Our next stop is right next to the Gozenberg border crossing, past the rat infestation, and we head on to the woodland farm. This is right on the edge of explorable territory. This black zone, you just can't go back there. Maybe it'll be expanded upon as early access continues, or maybe it will always be considered the edge of the map. Pull up the map here, we are right here, the very northeastern corner of Tiltron. Woodland Farm is the last stop. So here we have Carrie, distraught that her husband is riddled with the plague. She can no longer find enough food to be able to take care of him, and he is starting to lose his mind. So Taurus here is infected. This unit is sick with the plague. They can only eat meat and may go mad if they become famished. But he is also a level 3 warrior, which is pretty significant. If you talk to him, you can either execute him for 3 infected blood or you can recruit him to the party for cured meat times 5. I have usually only executed him, but this time I want to see what happens when we bring him in. It says his daily food consumption is only one. It's not like he eats excessively. And I need somebody to fill in the final job slot once we unlock it. So we're going to go ahead and recruit him because we have so many cured meat. And here we go. Taurus has joined your troop. Co your companions find him friendly. Well, at least he has a nice personality. If you take Taurus back into town and give him a cure for the plague, you get a 100% chance to heal him, and so that will remove the restriction of him only being able to eat meat and the potential of turning on you if he becomes famished. So we will heal him up right here. His face is looking nice and shiny, good and healthy. Let's see if there is anything that his wife has to say if we take him back to her and she gets a good look at him. His wife doesn't seem all that interested now that I've cured her husband, so maybe it wasn't love and he's better off with us anyway. Before we get to our bonus secret for you guys, if you enjoyed the video, please support it, like, and subscribe to the channel. Let me know what region you would like to see next if you enjoyed this format of video or if there is another gameplay aspect you would like to see a guide for. Our first bonus is this set of uh, vigilante farmers. They get the little pitchfork icon above their heads, but they look like they are trained soldiers. If we're checking in on the map, they're going to be roaming right around the salt mine, and they come up, they're drunk, they aggro you, they are more annoying than anything else. If you attack them, then you get a moderately challenging combat encounter, and you'll be able to pick up five leather. If you give them some wine, then you'll be able to pick up some influence, and you should be able to uh, knock them out of commission for a bit. And by a bit, they never come back. 
Our last little bonus is that you can walk along the coast here. There is a large zone of effectively no locations that are designated on the map, but if you hike out here, there's going to be a lot of resources that you can pick up. You can fish in the ocean. There'll often be bandits patrolling the zone if you want a combat encounter or find some prisoners. And then you can also make it along this narrow stretch of beach to be able to progress farther in, and you are uh, teased with resources up here on this ledge, but there is no way that I have been able to find to actually climb these cliffs. I know that the game does have sometimes secret passes up the cliffs. Um, I've not been able to figure out how you can make it up here though. You get even more items up here. It looks like this could be potentially a clandestine meeting place of some advanced mission later on, or maybe a future spot for a location. They say they are adding Forsaken Villages in a soon-to-come update. This could be a prime location for one of those. And we see a camp. Someone has made camp right up there. But again, there is no way to be able to get there, and you can actually hop up on these mountains. Let's see, if I swing the camera all the way around, you can stand over back here. You can stand right over here, as I think is as close as you can get. But there is no way down either that I've been able to find. So if somebody has found a way to be able to make it up here, please let me know. I would love to be able to explore around and see what's up there. And that is everything, and I do mean everything possible to do here in Tiltran. Just look at how beautiful this place is. Honestly, I am feeling a little bit sad now that I've completed everything and will have to move on to a new region. But once again, if this video was helpful, leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you want to see my future War Tales videos. I had a lot of fun putting this together, and I'm really loving the game. Let me know if you like this style of guide, what region I should go to next, and some better names for my companions, because right now it's honestly a little embarrassing. Until next time, thank you guys for watching, and have a good one.